I wish them strength during this incredibly difficult time. Mr. Speaker, I'm thankful for the opportunity to put words on the record today regarding Bill C-14, the Economic Statement Implementation Act, and I will be splitting my time with the member from Levi Le Pignier. This bill, introduced this past fall, implements a boost to the Canada Child Benefit, which we know is a popular program for Canadian families that originated under Prime Minister Stephen Harper. Our new leader, the MP for Durham, championed this boost when he was running for leadership of our party, so I am glad to see the Liberals agreeing with our Conservative Party leader on this provision. The bill also makes changes to the rent subsidy, which Conservatives have been calling for since it was first introduced last summer. And in fact, I personally questioned the former Minister of Finance on the original program, which was deeply flawed and failed to support thousands of small businesses in need, including many in my riding. Most of the financial supports contained in this bill, Conservatives agree are needed to continue to support Canadians while lockdowns and restrictions continue to ravage our private sector and drive our small businesses to bankruptcy and leaves millions of Canadians unemployed. Unfortunately, Bill C-14 also includes some very worrying provisions. It seeks to increase the maximum borrowing authority from the current $1.1 trillion to $1.8 trillion for the next three years, which is $700 billion of potential spending in the next three years, all of which would be financed through deficit. And of that $700 billion, it includes $100 billion for discretionary stimulus spending. And although no one really knows what that means because details have yet to be provided, so as a result, it has inspired very little confidence in Canadians that this Liberal government has a plan to get us out of this health crisis and recover our damaged economy. Ultimately, this increase is far greater than the government needs to get through the next fiscal year and authorizes a massive expansion to the national debt without any fiscal anchor or scrutiny of the dangers new debt, this new debt creates. And overall, the COVID deficit uh, that Canadians are inheriting is truly astounding. At over $336 billion in a single year, it will take a Herculean effort, a lot of hard work to get it under control. The C.D. Howe Institute, a highly respected nonpartisan Canadian think tank, recently put out a strong warning to the Liberal government about the financial perils Canada faces if we cannot get the debt and deficit under control in the near future. They said, and I quote, Canadian government's deficits in fiscal 2020 and 2021 will total about 20% of Canadian GDP, the highest among all advanced economies, and seven percentage points higher than the average G20 country. Pretty shocking, Mr. Speaker. The C.D. Howe Institute report goes on to say that, quote, year upon year of expenses exceeding revenue and the resulting deterioration of the federal government's net worth, in other words, an accumulated deficit that keeps rising, signify an ongoing deterioration in Ottawa's ability to deliver services to Canadians. Conservatives have long sounded the alarm of the perils of unchecked spending, that if interest rates go up, which we know they will, the more Canadians have to pay on our debts, which means less to spend on critical services like health and education transfers to provinces, defence and infrastructure spending, and the critical social safety net that the federal government provides to Canadians on behalf of taxpayers. And Mr. Speaker, we know that the entire world is facing the same issues facing uh, Canada as we battle COVID-19, and yet Canada has spent more money per capita than any other country in the world. While at the same time, as other countries like the US and the UK have presented plans to reopen their economies safely and permanently based on data, Canada is entering its third wave of lockdowns. And further, despite astronomical spending, we are hovering between 40th and 50th, and sometimes even lower than 50th, in the world for vaccinations with only 2.1% of our entire population having received both doses of the vaccine to date. So more, more vulnerable and elderly will die as a result of the poor vaccine procurement strategy of this government. I cannot stress how serious this is. This is a national shame and a strategy that could have been avoided. The Liberals wasted 100 days on the Chinese company CanSino before signing contracts with other vaccine companies. That is a fact. They put all of our eggs in one basket. They bet the entire future of Canada on the Communist Party of China. And within a week of the Prime Minister announcing this vaccine contract with CanSino, two Canadians, the Communist Party of China cancelled that contract, which left Canada scrambling to sign other contracts in August. This is months after the pandemic started. We're in August when they were scrambling. 
And by that time, other countries in the world had long before us signed contracts with Pfizer, Moderna, and others. This is one of the reasons why we are so far behind our G7 allies and countless other countries for our vaccination rates. The Liberals wasted 100 days betting on it, Mr. Speaker. And just this week, the director of the Chinese Center for Disease Control and Prevention admitted some Chinese-made vaccine offered low protection against COVID. Their vaccines don't even work, Mr. Speaker. And yet the prime minister's decisions to waste time pursuing a vaccine partnership with the Communist Party of China will haunt Canada for generations and may cost us thousands of vulnerable lives. And their horrific mismanagement does not end there. By and large, Canadians recognize this is a wartime effort. And although conservatives, I feel, would have been much more respectful and considerate of the long-term damage of record deficit spending than the Liberals, we have fully and proudly supported the emergency spending measures that Canadians, in their greatest hours of need, that have helped them get through these incredibly difficult times. We recognize how important those critical measures are. The difference, though, is how Conservatives would have prepared Canada before the pandemic hit and what we would be doing now and after the pandemic is over. The first thing, Canadi Conservatives would not have shuttered Canada's highly regarded international early warning pandemic system as the Liberals did in May 2019. The Liberals broke their promises, their promise to run three modest deficits of $10 billion annually and instead ran up $100 billion of deficits during a relatively stable economy in their first term. So they broke that promise, ran up the debt, spent the cupboards bare in the good times. And they justified this spending by promising it would create incredible economic growth, and yet Canadians experienced sluggish economic growth during the Liberals' first term. So the bottom line, Mr. Speaker, is the Liberals left Canada vulnerable before the pandemic hit, and that's on them. But I think the question many people ask is, what would Conservatives do? And Mr. Speaker, so if we were in the driver's seat, what would we do? I'd like to talk a bit about that as I wrap up. So in addition to calling on the federal government to bring forward a data-driven plan to support provinces in a safe, gradual, and permanent reopening, our conservative leader was the first leader on the national stage to present a recovery plan to Canadians. So I'll repeat that he is the first and only leader on the national stage to present a plan to Canada to get us back on track and he provided a top five list of priorities in his plan. So number one, secure jobs. Our plan is to recover the million jobs lost during the pandemic, and that will be the priority number one for a conservative government. And by unleashing the power of our private sector and using conservative ingenuity and a can-do attitude, we will ensure every region and every sector of our economy is firing on all cylinders. That's priority number one, Mr. Speaker. Number two, secure accountability. After years of corruption and embarrassment and ethical scandal from the Liberal Prime Minister like Aga Khan's billionaire island, SNC-Lavalin, the WE Charity, just to name a few, Canadians deserve the strongest anti-corruption laws this country has ever seen, and we will deliver that, Mr. Speaker. So number three, secure mental health with a mental health action plan. And, and this one in particular, I'm very proud that, to see our leader bring this forward because I've spent countless hours on the phone with my constituent that are in very, constituents that are in very desperate situations. I've had Parents call me and tell me that their children, their little children don't want to eat because they're depressed. I've had the elderly women cry to me on the phone that they don't want to spend their last months or years on this earth locked away in their apartments away from their grandchildren and their families. And I can go on about the devastation of this. So I'm very proud to see mental health as the number one, as the number three priority on our top five priority list. And number four, secure our country by creating a strategic stockpile of essential products and building cap, uh, capacity to manufacture vaccines at home. I know every Canadian wants to see this and wants to never again to see that our people will be left vulnerable and dependent on other countries during the pandemic. And finally, we will secure Canada's economy by balancing the books responsibly over 10 years. And I spoke at length today of the perils of liberal spending. And I believe that Canadians agree that we need a competent government to handle this and to get our economy's finances back on track upon our recovery of the pandemic. And ultimately, I'll say in conclusion, Mr. Speaker, that Canadians know the Conservatives are the party best able to manage jobs in the economy. It's what we're known for and have been known for for decades. So we will provide that steady, reliable and competent leadership in the, our country's greatest time of need. That is my commitment, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Uh, question, commentaire, on la député. Questions and comments, the Honourable Member for Lac saint jean Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank my Honourable colleague for her speech. 
I was listening attentively to her speech, and I heard her say, well, what would the conservatives do? And then she explained various things, but she didn't mention that when it, anything about the uh, Canada health transfers, which are absent from C-14. Would the Conservatives commit to increasing the Canada health transfers to 35% of health costs, as the Premiers of Quebec and the other provinces and territories have called for? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Kildonan. Honourable Deputy de Kildonan saint -Paul. I think, Mr. Speaker, I thank my honour. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Je remercie mon collègue du Québec pour sa question. Les conservateurs sont d'accord de façon générale que les transports en santé doivent être stables, répondre aux besoins des Canadiens, mais la différence entre les libéraux et les conservateurs, c'est que nous croyons que les transports en santé devraient être donnés aux, aux provinces sans condition. Nous voyons constamment le gouvernement libéral imposer des conditions dans les transferts aux, en santé. Nous ne sommes pas d'accord. Nous croyons que les soins de santé doivent être octroyés par les provinces et les territoires. Donc, nous cherchons à donner cette autonomie aux provinces et aux territoires. Question et commentaire, l'honorable député de Winnipeg Centre. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh... Merci, M colleague who uh, spoke about uh, how the Conservatives introduced the child tax benefit, a benefit with a discriminatory structure for families with precarious immigration status, including refugee claimants, who are prevented from accessing this critical benefit, even if they are legally working and filing personal income tax. I'm wondering if my colleague agrees with the a recommendation from campaign uh, 2020 20, uh, report with states and quotes for some children their parents immigration status is a barrier to accessing the child uh, uh, canadian child tax benefit to address this amend the income tax act by repealing section 122.6 which ties eligibility for the K ccb to immigration status of the applicant parent Every parent in Canada who is considered a resident for tax purposes should be eligible for the CCB, regardless of immigration status. Uh, does my colleague agree with their recommendation? A member for Kildonan and St. Paul. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank my honourable uh, fellow colleague from Winnipeg for her question. I'd have to look into further the, the provision that she's talking about. It sounds very interesting. But what I could say about refugees is that the Conservative Party strongly supports humanitarian efforts to support the world's most vulnerable. And when I was Shadow Minister for Immigration for the Conservative Party, uh, what I was most shocked to see is that the Liberal government's narrative is that they are the party of immigration, that they are the most compassionate party on this. And yet, when I looked into what was happening under their watch in immigration, I was completely appalled by the lack of dignity, compassion and respect that they provide to new Canadians, to new immigrants, to prospective Canadians trying to come to Canada to join their families. I was completely appalled of how they treat immigrants. And I will continue to stand up for new Canadians, Mr. Speaker. Uh, questions and comments. The Honourable Member for Cloverdale, Langley City. Yes, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, we've been watching unhinged borrowing by the Liberals, which the finance minister has described as preloaded stimulus to cover up the fact that COVID support programs by far overpaid those who didn't even need the help. Now, part seven of Bill C-14 is an alarming black Amex card for the Liberals. So do you believe that Canadians should be concerned about the undisciplined spending that seems to just keep happening? Member for Kildon and St. Paul. Yes, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank my wonderful, honourable colleague for all the work that she does and for her question. And I am personally very alarmed uh, at this spending. I, we recognize that in these difficult economic times with these shutdowns, because governments shut down small businesses and the private sector, that we had the that the governments had responsibility to support Canadians. My my concern is that they're looking for unfettered access, essentially, to increase the debt burden by seven hundred billion dollars in the next three years, with very little parliamentary oversight. I think all Canadians are concerned about that. And further to that, I'm quite concerned that the Minister of Finance has never really indicated that she's at all concerned of the, her financial management of this country. I would, I would expect a little bit of humility and concern for the future on what is being done and how much work it's going to take to get us back on track. Resuming debate, the Honourable Member for Lévis Lubinière. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm pleased to take part in the debate on Bell C-14 the 2020, uh, 20, 